Hi, everybody. Welcome to Custody Matters Live. My name is Danica Joan, and we are doing a, a special feature on adult children of parental alienation. And so we've got several guests lined up uh, with us, and one of them is Elise Price Tobler. She is actually here from Australia. We've got her, uh, we're communicating um, remotely through Zoom, obviously. Uh, but I wanted to bring her on because she is an adult child of parental alienation and now has actually made it her life's mission. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Danica. Good evening. <laughs> so share with our viewers a little bit about who you are, your background. I know that we, we met through the, the spring conference that ended up online called Guardians and Gatekeepers Conference, and you, you did a wonderful lecture. Um, but for our viewers who didn't get that opportunity, share with them about who you are and what you're able to provide to, um, to, to the conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for anybody who's out there taking the time to actually come in and listen to me so many things out there in the world it's a privilege to have you actually come in and watch our little chat so thank you um like danica said my name's elise i'm a clinical psychotherapist with a master's degree in psychotherapy and counseling um, i'm currently doing a phd in parental alienation it's, uh, something that i have a huge passion for i think about it most of the day I work in private practice also with adult children of PA, not young children, not parents, but the adult children. Um, I was a child of severe parental alienation and I didn't see my father from about the age of six or seven until I was about 30 and then we reunited. So during that time is a huge journey in itself and what I'm trying to do along with Dawn McCarty is try and put in some measures for um, prevention rather than cure because we're, I believe we're the first cohort to really go through, we we're, were children divorced in the 60s. So my family were actually the first family in a Catholic school to be labeled as children of divorce. So that was a big label to carry back then and carried a lot of stigma. And um, yeah, you just travel through life and I just wanted to share what the experience has been like because it's been very difficult at very different at different times. And um, we, I, I believe that if we start talking about it now, then we can prevent future generations from going through what we went through. But having said that, the intergenerational trauma that we have experienced has filtered down to the next generation at this point and we're trying to do the work that we need to do in this generation so to stop it from filtering down too much and when we see it filtering down we're trying to heal the wounds that are coming through our children and grandchildren now so that's the space that i'm working in at the moment danica so I know you said that that you were able to reunite with your dad at 30 and I find that to be an interesting age because a lot of times when children hit about 30 they're really questioning where they well they probably spend a lot of their time grappling in their 20s about where they came from and what worked and what didn't work but what was significant about uh, significant about the age of 30 that had you reconnect with your dad well, I'd been, I'd started therapy. So I was working with a nun, with a Catholic nun, actually. She was the first one who was able to work with me. I'd tried a few other lines of therapy before that. But um, because I was a child of severe parental alienation, I grew up with no voice at all. So talking about what had happened anywhere right up until 30 was not something that I was going to step into the space of. I wasn't used to speaking about it and I was in complex grief and had a lot of PTSD as well. So, uh, and we were trained uh, very, very strongly not to speak about our father when he left 
we weren't allowed to talk about him, we weren't allowed to grieve, we weren't allowed to um, have any voice around that at all. And it's crucial that children are allowed to grieve because it's a very, very interesting, pro very, very interesting process called because I believe if children are old enough to grieve, uh, children are old enough to grieve if they're old enough to love. So I loved my dad, but when he left us, he, he left us. It wasn't, um, they did get divorced, but he chose to leave the family for another family. Um, so that's, that brings a lot of grief for a child, that space. He um, had a pretty, wild time after he left us and we were left with our mum who was then in grief herself so she was telling me the story about um when he left she was left with a car that wasn't registered and a, a, a um 50 dollars in her purse so left us very very poor and alone and in grief so it's a very tricky space Wow. I'm just noticing your light there, Danica. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Are you good to keep working or is it uh, um, upsetting that light? My, okay, so my office is in my house. It's 120 years old. Oh, um, love it. <laughs> maybe, maybe we're getting a message from my grandparents or something. <laughs> so I'm telling if it, if you believe in those things, which some of us do, it, flickers when we're yeah on, at interesting times yeah well that's <laughs> um, yeah so you know as you were talking it just it hit me like it hit me like something I'd never um never thought about before but my mom was a child of parental alienation no goodness okay like I know her story why I, I've, I've done this for so many years why I didn't connect the dots until you spoke it which part of it was what that was it that got you to sort of realize that well I think part of it was you know you you had a little bit of a like a breakthrough at at 30 through counseling my mom she was about 18 so her her and her three other siblings um were when things didn't work out with ma you know with my grandmother and my grandfather um she was not allowed to reach out to her dad it was it was and it was beyond that it was kind, it was that you're not allowed to have a difference of a different opinion because that's disrespectful yes. You're not allowed to basically have a voice. Um, so you just, and, uh, but I know in particular, she said a lot of, she was the, she was sort of the, the black sheep of the, of the family. And she snuck away at 18 to go see her dad, um, which the other three were afraid to ever do. Yes. And I do remember, was, I was really small. My mom was probably, approaching 30 i think when her dad was on his deathbed because i remember i was so small and i was went into this darkly shrouded uh, bedroom and it smelled like death and um mm -hmm. and of course it it was it became I, I became aware that she was seeing her dad for the last time but oh, he was the only, he was the she was the only sibling that had the courage to step away from uh, mom's uh, demands that you you never betray me by going and having a relationship with him yes okay so she sort of stepped out of the enmeshment the cross coalition stuff like very full-on that energy is very very powerful to step out of that energy of the mom is huge I'm glad that they did that and it you know it's interesting because it would make a lot of sense now so many things starting to make sense because because in my own situation in 2000 uh 2000 2001 when i left um an abusive situation and it ended up being 
uh, being targeted as, you know, um, with parental alienation. Like, it's almost like when you start uncovering the chapters, the generations, it's like, well, that was predictable. It was predictable that somebody in the family was going to repeat the cycle. Yes, absolutely. And children of PA often repeat the cycle themselves because that's what they're taught. Mm -hmm. They're taught this alignment, this threat is looming in the distance. We could be taken, we could be all of this sort of stuff. So you have to do the same thing with your child. It's, it's what we're taught. It's very difficult to challenge those very early patterns that we're taught, but it's imperative that we do it because it's not okay to be practicing that when you are a child of PA and you grow up and start having your own children. It's not okay to be doing that and it's hard too because it's a lot, a lot of us carry very big abandonment wounds and often the children will regulate us when we have them and to have them taken away from us can cause a lot of distress because we've already had a lot of distress when we've been growing up. Complex grief, PTSD, um, abandonment, rejection is a big one as well. So when we have children, it, it's funny, they feel a lot of those wounds because all of a sudden you think they're not going anywhere, they're babies, they're children, I, they're not leaving. And then if somebody kind of comes into the space or you end up arguing and separating with somebody, it looks like they're going to take the children, that can cause very big dysregulation in an alienator. So you have to do work in that space. It's quite intergenerational too. But often the person who is the alienator has a lot of childhood stuff that they haven't worked through as well. I can, I, you know, now that I've had that aha moment, oh, I, you know, my, my brain is going like, oh my God, I remember yeah. this and remember this and remember this. Okay. I'm uncovering and you're like, oh my gosh, no wonder um, I would say that, you know, when you're, uh, my mom was raised in extreme poverty, but when you're relying on a woman, which back in the day, women didn't make a livable income, you know, and when you cut a, you know, a dad out of the, their life, that is possibly the income that could have actually supported the family and given them a livable wage. I mean, there's just so many whatevers, you know, just from marginalizing them. But um, you also, ra you know, the children are raised that, um, you know, the, the other parent is optional. It can be marginalized if they're, if they don't meet, if they don't cut, you know, they, if they don't qualify for, you know, uh, parent status, they can be replaced or yeah. they can be marginalized. I can see so much. Um, you know, my mom married my dad. My dad was a very, was he. He traveled and it was okay because my mom wasn't used to having a dad in her life. So for him, this you know, is the thing, this is the thing. And you do, you grow up and if you don't have a dad around, you don't, you don't understand what it's like to have one either. So you're at risk if you have children of repeating it because you don't really see the point to them and it can go the other way too. So if the child's left with the dad, which is my partner's case, and the mum left, he does not understand what it's like to have a mum around and he really struggles with me giving him, showing him affection and love in a mother. Like, you know, when somebody gets hurt and you just want to hug them, he doesn't get that space So, because he didn't have the mum doing that. So this is another reason why we have to have both parents. They, they bring in... They both bring in really, really important parts for a child. Mm -hmm. So, and the dads can provide different things. Like dads can tell you sort of, you know, how they taught you how to ride a bike, how they, how they um, taught you how to build things. Mums can tell you what score the kid's getting at school. Like they have different qualities that they bring to a child and, to grow up with only one gender is very, it's, it's, it just completely cuts off a whole half of us that we can explore. And a lot of us 
that I know who are ACODs, adult kids of divorce, we call us, um, we are also quite masculine as well because we've had to be. So I grew up, grew up, I spent a lot of time with my grandfather. So he taught me some pretty great skills. But then I grew up knowing, I mean, I can do anything. I can fix cars. I can do fencing. I can build things. I can, I just, the, the other side of me has, is very, very strong as well. So there's, it's a bit of a, yeah, that's a blessing as well. So I'm also an emergency services worker. So I can get up on roofs after storms. I can do floods. I can do cr road crash rescue. I can do all of that stuff. But that's because dad wasn't around. So I had to learn all those skills as well. Because that's kind of the masculine part that you'd like to be taught or mm, not have to do is also another part of it. Because, you know, there are some roles that a male, not, not, not wanting to sound sexist, but, you know, they're like some things like fixing the car and stuff like that. A lot of girls don't do, but we get forced into those roles as well. So it's pretty interesting. You do grow up with a lot of extra skills, I believe, more than a lot of other girls. <laughs> Maybe yeah. we can change tyres, everything out in the middle of the freeway. We can do pretty much everything. But um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting way to grow up. But yeah. I, I have a question about with, okay, so um, considering maybe there was abuse, there was spousal abuse involved. And a lot of, I mean, I have it that just because there was spousal abuse and it, that's not an automatic marginalize that, uh, that parent because they were an abusive spouse, not an abusive parent per se. Um, but you do have parents who are desperate, you know, that's their babies, you know, they're wanting to protect their child. Um, what is your view on that when there's, when there's spousal abuse, abuse involved? Yeah, so, well, we were always told that there was spousal abuse involved and that my dad was very aggressive. He was very violent. He did have a violent history. Um, he has a very aggressive, he's a very ex extroverted person as well. But then saying that, so is my mother. So I think a lot of the time when they separated, that was very much used against him. I saw a little bit of it, but the thing is when you're a small child, if it's not coming at you, you can, you can see it. But if it's not coming at you, like my dad would never, ever hurt me. We have other adult kids that we speak to and we know the same thing. If there's stuff going on in the home, between the parents, if it's not directed at the child, we shouldn't be stopped to see our parent. That's not okay. That's not okay. That's our relationship with our parent. If they hurt us, that's a different matter altogether. But my dad never ever hurt us. He never laid a finger on me. So if we went on contact visits, all he was was loving and kind and just, uh, 100% there when I was visiting my grandparents as well. So he'd take us to see his grandparents on most contact visits, which we didn't get very many of, but they wanted to always see us as well because their grandparents, they're my uncle and aunt, they all wanted to see us. So we'd all have sort of family lunches, but never ever did anything happen between my dad and we children. So to have stopped that relationship because of something going on between them, like my mum and dad, that that would have been terrible for us. So, yeah, as it was, it was already bad enough, let alone having to not be able to see him. And it got to the point where they stopped him seeing us anyway. And that was very violent. Like, I think my grandfather had a shotgun and he was actually aiming it at my dad when he came over to pick us up one day. So, you know, and my dad said the reason why he left was because he would see our faces from the stories that we were being told about him. And he'd see it, he'd see us. It got to the point where we'd heard so many stories when he showed up 
we'd have looks of terror on our faces. And he said he'd take one look at us and think to himself, oh, my God, what are these kids being told? And then he said, I just couldn't bear it any longer. I couldn't bear, I didn't know what you were being told. I could see it in your faces and your body language. And he said, I decided to step out at that point for your own psychological good. Now, that's a very powerful thing. That's what made him decide to walk away at that point when we were about seven. But I and, was anyway. and it's something that it, you know, we know now or a lot of people, um, people I share is never, uh, of course you don't want to be part of their pain, making it worse. But if no. it, you know, but it's also important that, that you, um, remain somewhat present in their lives in some fashion. Maybe it's not in the tug of war custody exchange, but maybe it's being in their extracurricular activities or, you know, just letting them yeah. see you in the stands and letting them know that you care. Um, yeah. That's what I share with people. I, um, I, I yeah. want you to talk to, because a lot of our viewers are targeted parents. And they are dealing with uh, exactly that, that your father had to deal with. And mm -hmm. they don't know what to do because, you know, because they, they haven't been the child. Um, what would you say would make a difference to maybe crack the shell of an alienated child so that maybe there is, is an opportunity for, um, you know, access to a relationship? Yeah, it's very different because we're of the severe PA kind. Um, visitation and things like that was not promoted. Let's put it that way. And if we ever talked about wanting to see our dad or how much we missed him or loved him, it was a very dangerous place for us to be because if we spoke about that, then we were at risk of um, the... Um, alienator becoming dysregulated. So we had to be quiet and just suck it up, basically, cope. But what I used to look for um, from that position was if there was anything coming in the mail, like a card or a phone call coming through or anything that told me that he was still thinking about me or he still cared about us. That's what I was looking for. And I know that they were hiding the mail. They were hiding any presents that came through because dad, when I was 30, said we sent lots of presents. We sent cards at birthdays. And I used to wait outside when I was really little, like five or six, hoping that a card would be delivered from him or my grandmother. And I could see sometimes when I, because I was living with my grandmother at the time because we were left with nothing. So we had to move in with them. She would hide it. So at least I knew that the postman had delivered something. I knew that he was thinking of me. That was enough for me to know that he still was caring and thinking about me. That's a very extreme thing for a child to be waiting for and thinking like, but that was our normal because it was a severe end, like I keep saying. So... Little to bit hide your love, you if you yeah. did manage to to get a a postcard that you're that you're that slipped through the cracks. Yeah, well, they were stopping love. the mail. They were stopping the mail, but the fact what they couldn't stop was the fact that I saw the postie deliver it, and then they would hide it. They couldn't stop that process, and that was the only process basically that I had to show. But then after a couple of years, that stopped. And that was heartbreaking because I knew that that was possibly the end. I didn't have any, any more hope that he was going to keep thinking about me anymore. I would think that if you are, as a child, you know, you're secretly, you're, you, your love is hidden. You're not allowed to express your love. So you stuff mm -hmm. it. And then they, um, so the last thing you're going to risk is r reaching out to this, to the, to him, because there's got to, there had to have been a, 
a part of you that did get stuck, sucked into the story of he's dangerous, he's scary. Oh yeah, oh we totally believed it. Oh, we totally believed he was a monster. We believed he was going to kidnap us. We were being told that. When I would go out on contact visits, because I was the oldest, I was a, quite a parentified child, which means um, basically um, I took on the role of the parent when we were out. So I had two younger siblings and I was the child who was given the phone numbers to ring in case we were stolen, the money, in case I had to ring up emergency. Um, and when we would go out on contact visits, this was the space that we would go out in. I was on high alert to either him taking us or what we were also being told was his friends could take us as well, so we wouldn't know who they were. So we'd go out in public and wouldn't even know who was going to be potentially taking us. And my dad had no idea any of this was going on. So can you imagine taking, going to pick up your kids? They've been told that information. Like we were freaking out most of the visits. It got to the point where we couldn't deal with it anymore. It was wow. way too difficult to actually go on contact visits because we were scared to death of what was going to happen. This continued. This was a theme. So um, when we were at school, we'd be having to watch for people coming and taking us from school or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, and the interesting thing is, Danica, then when we were about nine or 10, my mom actually took us across the border without permission. So she actually took us. Mm. So, and my dad didn't know about it. So it was a very weird space, but we basically lived thinking people were coming most of the time to get us. And then she she worked, she was professional, but she'd be at work, but I'd be minding the kids the whole time. So being very parentified again, because there's not another parent there. And in the meantime, you've got the boyfriend that's coming through who mum's dating at the same time. And it's kind of like this world that you grow up in. It's it's not a it's not a world conducive to a good childhood at all. Oh, I can imagine. And um, I know we have just a couple minutes, so I wanted, but I did want you to be able to give to our, our viewers what 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 are they to do when yeah. um, you know when they have a child like the you know that they're trying to just tell them they love them. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. You've got to stay really healthy. Um, you've got to retain the essential part of who you are. If I had thought, look, part of me, even though all of this was going on, I loved my dad like mad. I missed him like mad. I grieved for him very badly. And part of me knew that he would never hurt me, even though we were being told all of this stuff. That's crucial because we were very extreme but there's a part of me who did not believe that he would hurt us. So when I grew up, that's why I was able to reconnect with him. And I said to him, I didn't actually believe what that you would really hurt us. And that was really big. He burst into tears. He said he'd never, ever have done that to us. But we children cannot bear the responsibility of having destroyed their parents. They just cannot do it. So if he had gone down the road of drugs and alcohol or killed himself or anything like that and I hadn't had the opportunity to reunite with him that would have been too devastating but he didn't he got on with life he remarried a couple of times um, but he got on with life and he kept working and he looked after himself and when I reunited with him he'd had a good life that made me happy if he hadn't that would have been very, very distressing. Another distress for me to have coped with as well. So the annihilation um, that people who, parents who are separating can do to themselves, don't, don't do that. You've got to, if you're being given the opportunity to um, pick yourself up, go to work, look after yourself, make sure that you try and do everything you can to stay in contact with your kids trust that they will know the difference between what they're being told is lying and isn't and just 
don't leave their lives. Just keep sending presents, keep sending cards, keep putting things on social media about yourself. Hopefully they'll come. Just keep the door open all the time, forever and ever and ever, no matter how long it takes. That's right. And definitely take have self-care. Like yes. you said, take care yes. of yourself and uh, yeah. because you want to be the parent that they're glad to see. Yeah. And even if you're unable to have any connection with the child at the present, um, one, of the re one of the textbooks that I read um, says that you're still parenting that child. So by just making sure that you're well, you're still parenting them, they'll see that instead of annihilation. That'll teach them uh, when things get hard, I need to annihilate myself. I need to do drugs and alcohol. Get yourself into therapy so that they know how to get through difficult times as well. Model that behavior to them. That's right. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Danica. So Thank you so much for, for um, joining me for this interview. I, I, uh, I hope that our viewers got something from this. Um, and wow, I always love uh, visiting with you, even, Thank you, even though we're half a world away. Yeah, no, it's amazing, isn't it? Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you for taking the time to be here with us. All right, take care. And we will see you again next week on Custody Matters Live.